I'm glad that you're in God's house. We're about to start our second installment in our new series. Everybody say new series. We believe Vision 2020 is going to prepare us, our families, our future for God's best for our life. And so I'm going to ask for the next few moments for your undivided attention. I'm going to ask that you would take perhaps your preconceived ideas and 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 what you think church is and what you think walking with God is and maybe just put it on on the shelf. I'm not saying get rid of it, but maybe just put it on the shelf for a minute. Let me invite you to new realms, new areas. Let me expose some things perhaps present them in a way you hadn't seen before and my hope in these next few weeks together is that God helps us see in us what he sees in us and that God helps us see around us what he sees around us is that all right father today what an honor to gather with all the people in this room today your sons your daughters my brothers and sisters God what an honor to have so many people watching from different parts of the country different parts of the world today online Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a spirit to receive all that you have for us today. God, we need you. Our church needs you. Our family needs you. And if we'll be honest today, so many of us, God, our hearts need you. Minister life to us. Minister strength to us. We ask in the blessed name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. You may be seated. Maybe seated. Um, I want to read a quick scripture to you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 to 17. This is the NIV translation. I've not stopped giving thanks for you. Remembering you in my prayers, keep asking God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom, revelation, so that you may know him better. I want to say this to you. There's a lot of pastors I... I got the privilege to travel and meet a lot of people, a lot of pastors who aren't grateful for the congregation that uh, they pastor. And I got to be honest with you, I'm thankful for you. You may not believe this. Maybe your, your mama don't love you, but I do. <laughs> Maybe you don't feel like anybody else cares about you, but I really do. Teresa and I, we pray for you. We go to the Lord on your behalf. When you cry, we cry. When you hurt, we hurt because we love you. And I'm thankful for an opportunity to be in this journey with you. And so because of that, we pray. And here's what we pray. We pray that God give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Here it is. Are you ready? So that you may know him better. Now, you, you may not know this, and, and I know that you're intelligent, and I'm not going to be very preachy, I think, today. Um, uh, you, I, I'm sure that you're cerebral. I'm sure you're intelligent, and I know that you passed the SATs better than anybody else in your class, and your wisdom is unparalleled. But can I please offer to you the concept that no matter how intelligent you are and no matter how many times you took Sunday school, some of y'all flunked Sunday school. Come on, you was with me in the corner. <laughs> I flunked Sunday school. Come on, somebody. They had to send me back twice. Anyways, the truth is, no matter how smart you are, how many classes you've taken, could I suggest to you there's more to God than you might know right now? I'll take the one. Come on, somebody. And if there's more, then there's, mean, there's, there's more opportunity for us to get better. How many of you would love an opportunity to be better? Anybody here want to be a better father? Anybody here want to be a better mother? Come on, anybody here want to be better at business? Here's a question. Are you ready? Anybody want to be better at loving God? Anybody want to be better at being loved by God? Yeah. Look at somebody say, we want to get better. So what we're calling this weeks, these weeks together is we're calling it a spiritual growth campaign. Problem with most people in church, not in this church, but in other churches, is that um, they stop growing. They reach a place of re revelation. And watch this. When you stop growing, you become cynical and critical. If the majority of your time at church, you're, you're judging people's worship, you're judging people's uh, sermon, you're, you're looking at the pastor and thinking, why is he wearing a red vest with gray pants? It doesn't match. Who dressed him this morning? Um, and if you're, if you're looking at all the externals, right, and you're not capturing the opportunity that God's giving you to develop, chances are somewhere along the way your growth, got, your growth got stunted. And so instead of becoming a professional worshiper, server of Christ, we become professional critics, right? We, we come to church and look at the things that dissatisfy us instead of the things that satisfy us. I want to say to you that's an indicator that somewhere along the way you stop growing. Amen, somebody. Are you tracking with me? Okay. 
How many of you stopped eating when you had a bad meal? <laughs> Come on. Uh, some of us ain't stopped eating for a long time. Come on. We don't even care if it's lunchtime. We just going to eat. All right. Well, that's another message for another day. So, so watch this. In um, Acts chapter 2, somebody say, we're going to grow. Come on, say it. We're going to grow. We're going to grow. Yeah. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now, the key word here is devoted. Somebody say devoted. A lot of times, did you ever want to devote your kids to something? Make your bed. Come on. You're not going to go outside till you make your bed. What we're trying to do is we're trying to, we're trying to make our kids be devoted, right? And I got I to gotta tell you, early on in ministry, I wanted people to be devoted. Why don't you come to church? Why don't you read your Bible? You go, we wanted to make people devoted. But here's, here's, the, here's the weird thing about the people in Jesus' day is they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. Now, now, how many of you are grateful for your parents? But how many of you want to be 35 year old and your mom walking in your room? Go, are you going to brush your teeth this morning? That would kind of weird for my wife, huh? I know somebody's going to get it today. How weird would that be? Your mom walking in your room. You're 35 years old. Hey, mijo, you're going to brush your teeth today. You'd be like, mom, really? Let my wife go to work before you do that. How's she like, what are you talking about? Some of you have been serving God for a long time and you still want me to devote you. I'm asking you for this next six weeks, be devoted on your own. Look at your neighbor and say, be devoted. Here's what I'd like for you to devote yourself to, okay? Devote yourself to weekend worship. I know some of you guys are like, you schedule your time with the Lord so you give two weeks a month to Jesus, two weeks a month to I don't know. Some of you guys are, look, I'm so proud of all you Seahawk fans that are up in the house today. Come on, somebody. Yeah. 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 God bless you. That's why the Cowboys, that's why the Cowboys play at one, because we respect God's time. Come on, somebody. <laughs> all right. Devote yourself. <laughs> Devote yourself to weekend worship. Whatever your normal excuses are, don't make them this month. Say, this month, I'm going to come every week. I'm not going to miss one week. Devote yourself to weekend worship. Here's another one. Are you ready? Uh, devote yourself to reading the daily devotional. In your small group, we're going to hand you a daily devotional that you can read every day. It's not very long. It's not very arduous. It's really simple, but it, it cuts a time out of our life that says, Jesus, you're so important to me. I'm going to take these few minutes. And here's what I'm asking you for the next six weeks or four weeks. I think we only got four weeks in this series. Um, don't miss a day of your daily devotion. Okay. Here's the next one. Uh, some of you don't attend a small group. And, and for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe you got people phobia. I don't know. Uh, maybe you got a bad experience, but I, I promise you, if you're a life group leader, do me a favor, a small group leader. Would you stand to your feet really quick if you're a small group leader? You stand to your feet. These are some of the coolest people you're ever going to meet. I'm not kidding you. They really are. You can be, you can be seated. You can be seated. And, and if, if you just got a glimpse, a glimpse of them and you're not in a small group, I want to encourage you just, just for four weeks. Do me a favor. And those of you who are going to small group, but you're like a visitor, right? You come like once a month, two months. You know? No condemnation. I'm not, this is not a condemning. I'm, I'm just telling you for this few weeks, let's devote ourselves. Is that all right? Look at your neighbor and say, devote yourself. And uh, you, you probably, actually this, I, I feel like the church is coming in seasons and waves. So the old, if you've been a changing point church for a long period of time, you can finish this statement with me. But some of you have probably not heard me say this enough. I would say this almost every week or almost every other week. So let me say it to you right now. You only have as much of God as you have of his little word, much word. Here's what I'd like for you to do. Would you try this week to memorize or for this next four weeks, memorize one verse a week? How many of you know the lyrics to songs? Like how many of you know lyrics 
that you didn't even know you knew. I did that. I was like walking into a grocery store, Angel, and I started singing the song. And I'm like, I didn't even know I knew that song. How did I know that song? Because watch, you know what? We couldn't listen to secular music, Dolores, in my house. That was Satan. We didn't listen to secular music. But I was on the bus at school for 45 minutes because we lived out ten bucks. Come on, somebody. So all the way in, Drew, I was listening to Michael Jackson. Come on, REO Speedwagon. I want to know what love is. Y'all don't know? How did I know that? Because it came into my ears. So maybe just turn off the radio and put the word of God on. You know what I'm saying? Maybe instead of just watching every sports center. Maybe for, for the next half hour, just put the word of God on. I mean, because you only have as much of God as you have of his. Uh-huh. So, so uh, they broke bread in homes together. They ate with glad and sincere. They love people. Someone say, can, can I go back up just a little bit? Someone say small groups. Small groups. Small groups. Um, a, a lot of you may be feeling like, you know, there's a lot of reasons not to go to small groups. Let me restate that. There's a lot of excuses that we could come up with to not go to small groups. But the truth is, every one of you desires a small group. And, and what we don't realize, what we don't realize emphatically, somebody say emphatically, is um, the voices in your life will determine the choices that you make. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, trust me, I'm going to let this marinate in. Here, here it is. Are you ready? Your choices are a byproduct of the voices in your life. What you're choosing today is usually by the people you surround yourself with. Your appetites, your desires. Come on, somebody. Or, are you ready? They're a byproduct of the lack of voices in your life. If you're not making godly family decisions, it's probably because there's not godly family voices in your life. Come on. So, so how do I then begin the courage to make better choices? Well, you got to start by getting better voices. Somebody said it like this. They said, show me a picture of your friends and I'll show you a picture of your future. I think I'll try one more time. Show me a picture of your friends and I'll show you a picture of your futures. Some of you hang out with people you don't even really like, but you don't got any choice. It's the only people who walk, invite you over to watch the game. Come on, somebody. The only people who, nobody else invites me. I'm inviting you right now. There's somebody in this group that would love for you to come to their house, you to go to their house. They would love it. They would love to build a relationship with you. But you got to devote yourself. Somebody say devote yourself. Devote yourself. Does that sound good to you? Vision 2020, we really want to improve spiritual perception. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 says this, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. Sometimes we're stumbling over stuff that's right in front. Okay, how many of you guys, uh, how many of you guys don't turn on the light because you figure you've got it figured out at night? You ever walk out of your room at night and don't turn on the light? Because you got it figured out. And then in the middle of the night, there's a big cry. Ah! Right? Because you thought you had it figured out. But you didn't see that your son left the toy. Come on, somebody. <laughs> you didn't quite get the corner metal piece of the bed. Somebody say, ay, ay, ay. That's Spanish for ay, ay, ay. Don't, don't try walking by memory. Don't try walking in the darkness. We will stumble, and most of us stumble because we want to walk in darkness. Somebody say darkness. It, it takes a little extra effort to turn the light on. But man, does it change your world. It changes your world. Say your world. In, we have this incredible story in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6, verse 15 to 17. 
of Elijah and his servant. And Elijah, <laughs> oh man, this stuff cracks me up, Bernie. Elijah, the enemy is coming to destroy Elijah. They want to kill him for being a godly prophet. They want to kill him, right? And so Elijah's like having a sandwich. He's frying up some bacon, making some espresso. And his servant looks out the window and he's like, dude, what is your problem? We're going to die right now. He's like, why would you say that? He goes, there's thousands of enemies all equipped with the, the, the most modern artillery and they're coming with one thing in mind. They're trying to kill us and you're over here making a sandwich. Why would you do that, Elijah? Elijah comes over to the young man and he puts his hands on him and he says, God, let him see what he can't see. When you begin to see things the way God sees, you can be in the middle of the biggest fight of your life. The world can be against you and it may seem like there's no other way you can, but all you need is a man of God that can put his hands on your face and say, God, let him see what he can't see. All that your eyes see is not all that there is. We have a church that's become anemic because we can only see what our eyes see. Was the young man wrong? Did he lie? No, what you see is not. I'm not asking you to lie. Pastor, you don't understand. I feel alone. You're right. Pastor, you don't understand the world's against me. You're right. Pastor, you don't understand. There's no hope in this direction. You're right. But blessed is a man who puts his trust in the Lord and not the things of this world. When you and I begin to see God's way, there is no weapon formed against you that shall prosper. It didn't say there wouldn't be a weapon. It said the weapon wouldn't win. You got to get eyes to see what God. Oh man, see, you've been, you've been backing down from situations because you've only been using your natural eyes. And so you're walking away from things. You're giving up on things. You're getting discouraged about things that God designed you to win. But you can't hold on because you don't have the eyes to see. It's not that you're wrong about the challenges. Let me ask this. Could it be wrong about what you believe about God. Or maybe we don't believe like we think we do. God, open his eyes. Watch Ephesians again, chapter 1. I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance, in his holy people. Someone say his holy people. In his incomparably great power for us who believe. In the Passion Translation, it says, Open the eyes of their hearts. Let the light of your truth flood in. Shine your light of hope. You, of the hope you are calling them to embrace. Reveal to them the glorious riches that you are preparing in their inheritance and let them see full extent of your power that is at work in those of us who believe and it may be done accordingly to your might and power. Somebody say see. see. I'm going to give you one more thing about small group and it's one more thing about these next few weeks that I think it's important to you. Where would that young man have been where would that young man have been without the old man to lay hands on him? Can I, can I just pause here for a moment? Where would the young man have been without the old man to lay hands on him? Now, I just got to tell you this for a moment. I got up here and I sung this little song that most of you have never heard. You couldn't even connect with it. You, most of you couldn't connect with it. But there's a group of us here that know what it was like to come on a Sunday morning dressed in the best you had, even if it wasn't anybody else's best, it was your best. And we would show up in God's house, and there wasn't a big screen. If I can be honest with you, the church really wasn't that pretty. Sometimes it smelled a little musky. 
Usually it was in a neighborhood somewhere. Didn't even have asphalt. It was gravel. But when we would gather, we would wait on the presence of God till something showed up that you couldn't put on a screen, that you couldn't put on a piece of paper, that the preacher couldn't preach his way into it and he couldn't preach us out of it. You couldn't sing your way into it. You couldn't sing your way out of it. You just waited. And then all of a sudden, something would fall in the house. Are you tracking with me? And a sinner would come to God. A backslidden Christian would come back to God. Those of us who were here would have a hunger for God. And what, what I'm saying to you is, is I'm grateful for all this beautiful new stuff we got. Thank God for the screens and thank God for all of you watching online. But somebody's got to be an Elijah because the trial is coming. The struggle is coming. And all of these Christians born with pretty lights and born under this new auspice aren't growing deep enough roots. They're not developing big enough to stand in the midst of the storm and stand like Job saying, say, God, if you kill me, I'll trust you. Peter, no, I ran from him once. I'm not going to deny him again. Where is this next generation who doesn't quit? I know what you're missing. You're missing an Elijah that'll come into your situation and go, make a sandwich, baby. We're in a trial. I know. But he who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think is in this room. <laughs> you know, I'm going to throw my kids under a bus here really quick. And, and the truth is, I'm throwing your kids under the bus, too. Are you ready? 98% of your kids get a flat tire. They're going to pull over and wait for you. Eighteen, nineteen, twenty years old. Pop, my tire busted. Hey, when Jericho first got pulled over, dad, the cops got me. Who are you calling when you get into trouble? Are you this far into God that you still don't know who to call when trials come? Are you really this far in your time with God that every time a trial comes, you got to start complaining. You got to start waiting. God, help us to raise a generation who knows I'm going to lift my eyes toward the hills for my help comes from the Lord. You need to learn to depend on the Lord. So you should be at life group this week. You might get a flat tire. I learned how to change flats while I was still with my dad. I learned how to change oil while I was still with my dad. Elijah was the man that he was because when Elijah was there, Elijah taught Elisha. And had Elisha not witnessed Elijah crack the whip and split the Jordan, if Elijah had not performed miracles and shown the demonstration of the God that he served to Elisha, Elisha would have been another Christian wondering about the power and the ability of God. And I'm trying not to preach this message, but I got to be honest with you. There's so many of us who come to church, but we're still wondering, God, are you still there? God, do you still move? And that's because you haven't been around an Elijah who was being attacked by Ahab, who had a moment of difficulty, but saw the ravens come and feed him in a trial. Watch a crick that was dry run with water he saw him call and there was a cloud the size of a man's hand and just in a few minutes it became a thunderstorm at the word of elijah god give us a church that doesn't preach pretty that doesn't sing pretty but comes with the demonstration of the move and the power of god we used to lay hands on the sick and they get healed come on somebody Cast debt. Y'all remember that? Cast debt. We should cast devils out of folk. 
Some of you still need some casting out. Come on, somebody. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Let me get back to my message. Here's, here's what we need to see. Some say need to see. Number one, the hope of your calling. God, open our eyes to the hope of our calling. Before, this is Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, <laughs> I, I can't speak because I'm young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth. For you shall go to all who I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces. For I, some, some folk out there got ugly faces. Come on, somebody. Look at your neighbor and say, thank God I got a good looking face. You can look at me. Come on, tell them. That's some confidence. Say, I'm good looking. The other person on the other side, we're going to pray for you after church. Come on. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I will deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand, and he touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Jeremiah, I have a calling for you. And I want to preface the calling for you because as humans, we are really good at explaining away God's call for our life. Did you ever hear anybody go, Yeah, no, I'm not called to leadership. Why are you not called to leadership? I just don't feel it. Well, that's funny because while you were in your mother's womb, God already knew you. And because he knew you, he ordained you. Ordained is the word called, right? And he already called you before he ever released you. So you didn't come into the world to try to find a call. He called you before you ever came out. Let's just be honest. Let's just be honest. Coming out of the womb is a process. That's why, I listen, the only person who can love a baby when it's born is a mama. I looked at my three children. I'm like, what the happened? Face was stretched. Come on, somebody. A alien, look at. Thank God they retract. Come on, after a couple of weeks. Come on, they, they come back to normal. And see, the problem is when we come to God, we want to come to God with the natural problems that we have. We want to come to God with the natural setbacks. And here's what Jeremiah said. I, I would love to, but I'm young. Do I got any young people here that know there's a call of God inside of them, but struggle because they're young? I don't, I don't know, pastor. I don't know. I'm just kind of young. You know, in school, we don't do that stuff. I'm, I'm just in middle school. I, I'm just a junior higher. I, I, I'm too young for that. And Jeremiah, God said to Jeremiah, I don't care that you're young. I called you when you were an infant. If I can call you when you're an infant, Daniel. If I can call you when you're an infant, Samuel. If I can call you when you're an infant, David. If I can call you when you're an infant, Mary, then I can use you right now. You got to have confidence in the hope of your calling. Age doesn't hold you back. Well, I'm, I'm young and I, I don't talk too good. I'm not a good speaker. Anybody here, come on, can we just be honest for a moment? A, a lot of people don't know they can't dance. And you look at them and don't tell me you don't pray, Jesus, help this poor soul, Jesus. They just don't know. Out there making a fool of themselves, right? But how many of you know you can't dance? That's why if there's not a boom box and a piece of cardboard, I don't get on the floor. I know my limits. It's right here, look. That's it. That's what you get. Some of us won't do something great for God because we're looking at our weakness. And Jeremiah said, I can't talk very good. And here's what I love about God. When God calls you, he's aware of your weakness. And he doesn't run from your weakness, the Bible says. And he came and he touched Jeremiah's mouth. Why did he touch his mouth? Because that was his weakness. And I came to tell you, when God calls you, it doesn't matter how your story has been. It doesn't matter about your brokenness. And I know it's Sunday morning, and you're like, Pastor Eli, why are you so crazy? And it's because there's a calling inside of you, and the enemy is trying to confuse 
use you. And I'm here to tell you that God is going to touch your weakness and give you life. He called you, and there's hope for your calling, even if you're feeling weak. Look at somebody say, I'm not weak. I'm not weak. There is a confidence in the hope of your calling. Now, not everybody is called to be a minister. Or let me re restate that. Not everybody's called to be a pastor, but everybody's called to be a minister. Make sense? There's somebody in your life. Your, your relationship as a husband is a calling. You, you weren't born a woman by accident. There's a calling on your life. Your, the ability that you have, a, the privilege that you have a mother and father. Come on, somebody. If you have a mother and father, you've been called to be a son or a daughter. Don't minimize or marginalize that calling. Step into it. Look at your neighbor and say, step into it. Have a hope about it. Have a hope about it. I, gosh, I'm trying to move on to this. If, if you're between relationships, if you're older and not been married yet, Here's what everybody says. Uh, marriage is overrated. Or you'll hear people say, I'm never getting married. All that to set up is for mistakes. Well, where, where are you speaking from? Can I say this to you? You're speaking from a place of pain and lost hope. Oh, no, Pastor, I'm speaking about my experience. Okay, sweetie, listen, you are not more intelligent than God. I, I know. I know you feel like, we feel like, like we could just teach God a thing or two if he would listen to us. The Bible says a God, the Bible says a man that finds a wife finds a good thing. Amen. Marriage is good. Amen. Well, we fight all the time. They're good fights. <laughs> Come on, we can make up. Come on, somebody. Wow. Marriage is good. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the two amens. I'll take it. Marriage is good. The problem is, the problem is you're listening to the wrong voices. You got nobody in your life. I'm trying to move on from this. Everybody say grown up. When you're grown up, you love correction. I'll try that one more time. I'll put a smile on my face. Grown ups love correction. Babies hate being corrected. Because grown ups don't want to repeat the same mistakes, so we listen. Young people think they know it all, so they'll try it again. Yeah. Marriage is a good thing. Being in a relationship is a good thing. The problem is you've lost the hope of your calling. I get it. I get it. You've had some trials. I get it. Some of it may not even been your fault. Some of it may have been completely your fault. I don't know. But here's what I do know. That your weakness doesn't erase your calling. Your brokenness shouldn't take away your hope. Because you were made for great stuff. Look at your neighbor and say great stuff. Number two. Number two. Look at your neighbor say number two. God wants you to see the richness of your gifting. God has given each one of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Use them well to serve one another. Um, I walked out to the parking lot just a few minutes ago. First of all, thank you for our parking team, our children's team, our media team, our worship team. Thank you. We couldn't do it without you. And, and I walked out to the team and... Um, and I, I was watching Craig and, and Angel have a conversation, and, and they were talking about Craig was on this vacation, and they were having a conversation while they were serving. While they were helping making sure that your cars are safe and that you had a place to park, they were building each other up. Your gift will never be felt as long as it's contained within your vessel. Say it one more time. Your gift will never reach its full potential as long as it's contained within your vessel. 
And some of you are good looking. I ain't going to lie to you. Uh, some of you we got to pray for. But the rest of y'all, good looking. So make sure you're paying attention. So make sure you're paying attention. But none of us, somebody say none of us, have the spiritual gift of decoration. You weren't brought here to be a decoration. You were brought here to be an inspiration. And we inspire each other when we let the gift of God be used in God's house, be used in our neighborhood, be used in our workplace, be used wherever. It's not just the church. It's not just the church. It's everywhere. Somebody say everywhere. You know, Vince, there's this big move about, oh, we got to get outside the walls. And the truth is, we should have always been outside the walls. Right? But how many of you, by the way of your hands, how many of you have given your life to the Lord? Wave at me if you gave your life to the Lord. Okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, now, did you see all the hands up? Put them up one more time. Just put them up. Just for a fact. Look, look, everybody look around the room. Look at all these people who gave their life to Jesus. Christians, okay, good. All right, put your hand down. How many of you guys gave your life to the Lord in a place we call church building? Raise your hand. 99% of the people that raise their hand the first time, raise their hand the second time. Don't ever let anybody tell you you don't need to go to church. The church is not necessary. Don't, don't buy in that nonsense. Oh, we're just going to take ministry outside. That's a misappropriation of your gift. We do that outside because we are believers. But the Bible said don't forsake the assembling of self together. You, we come to God's house. Come on, somebody. Right? Having said that, you lend your gift in the house. You lend your gift outside of the house. Because the more love you give away, the more love comes back. Make sense? Uh, my wife's not here so I could tell on us a little bit. Because when she's here, she's looking at me like. She gave that wife look. You know, you don't even be no. Here, my wife and I, we got into a little discussion uh, the other day. And uh, she pointed out some things like I have this really gift. I have a real good gift of when my wife points out my faults. I got a couple of that I keep in the pine pocket. None of you got that gift. Yeah, I got that gift. So she comes. Like, hey, Eli, you did. It. I say, oh, OK. But here's what you did. And, and here's what I realized. Here's what I realized. Right. Her willingness to confront showed my weakness in confronting. So the only time I want to get confrontational is when you want to get confrontational. It's a self-defense mechanism. It does, it's not love. She's giving me her gift by saying, what you did made me feel this way. And instead of appreciating that gift, I'm going to go ahead and throw it back at her. But if I really loved her, I would embrace what she's saying. I would receive what she's saying, right? And then when it was my turn later on down the road, I would have that similar conversation. Is this helping you out yet? Love is only love when you give it away. Your greatest gifts will only be felt when you serve. And here's a hope. Somebody say there's a hope. That you are rich in gifting. You are rich in gifting. Um, I wish I had a lot more time to talk about this. There are things, <laughs> Jericho, Jericho picks on his mom because his mom is vertically challenged. You'll get that later on. And so PT's like reaching for something really high. It's not that high, but to her it's really high. And Jericho will come by, I got you, mom. And just give it to her, right? The, the truth is we, we laugh at those things and we say, Jericho, you're so mean to your mom. But the truth is he's doing something she can't. And you could be mad at the people who do what you can't, or you can embrace them. And it shows when you can't embrace people who can do what you cannot do, it shows your weakness. It shows where you need to grow. It shows where you need development. And how do I know I'm growing in the richness of my gifting when I'm not only contributing what I can contribute, but I'm embracing those who contribute where I can't. Does that make sense? I was telling, uh, I was telling Robert on my way in today, I was telling him that, you know, uh, I don't, I'm a backyard welder. I got any backyard welders? I can weld it enough to where it sticks together. It may not look good and it may not last too long, but I'll hold it together. 
How many of you know people like that? They don't do it really good, but they just kind of get through it, yeah? And then they want to give you advice at what you're really good at. <laughs> All righty. Embrace people who do it better. Embrace them. Because there's something you do I can't do. There's something I do that you can't do. We need each other. Come on, somebody. Are you tracking with me? All right. Phew. Number three, I got to hurry up. Number three. Look at your neighbor say number three. The third thing that God wants to open your eyes to see is that you are empowered. Somebody say empowered. You are empowered. I'll try to give this to you in a very practical way. Um, my kids are into cars. They like cars. They're starting to want to drive fast. But how many of you got a car with a good engine in it? Do you ever, do you ever? That's funny. Robert just cracked a joke real funny. He said something about Chevrolet. I almost laughed really quick. So, so you get in your car, your Camaro 66. You get in your garage. You turn that booger on and you floor it. You're, just, you're in your garage and that engine's going. And can I say something to you? You're making noise, but you ain't going nowhere. Right? What, what good is power for? Power is not necessary for the garage. Matter of fact, power is useless in the garage. At the end of the life of Jesus, he is now removed from the cross. They wrapped his body lifeless and cold. Then they laid it on a slab and entombed him by rolling a rock over the entrance. No oxygen, no heartbeat, no life, no hope. And the Bible said it was there on the third day that the power of God filled his body and quickened it. Do you know what you need power for? You don't need power when you come to church. You don't need power power when everything is okay you need power for those moments in life when you've done all that you know to do when you've given every last bit that you can and it seems like nothing is gonna work it's in that moment right there that the bible dictates these words and i hope you'll remember them that the same spirit that resurrected jesus from the grave lives in your mortal bodies the same power that resurrected him is the, the next time you look at a trial and the devil whispers in your ear and tells you that this is the end of your life, that this is the end of your home, that this is the end of your future. It is right there in that moment that the Holy Ghost will descend in available vessels and say, not today. I've got a call for this person. I've got a plan for this person. And what the enemy intended for trial, God turns into triumph. You are empowered. 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 You're empowered to make that business successful. You're empowered to make that life successful. The devil doesn't want you to recognize your power. It's the truth, man. I'm going to say the truth. I'm coming to an end like in 45 minutes, so stay with me. I've been on several airplanes and I heard this story and you can only when you hear something, you have to make a choice on whether it becomes something cool or something real. Not everything you think is cool is real. I heard somebody once say, hey, listen, this plane can't wreck because I'm on it. it seemed really arrogant. He goes, no, no, it's not the arrogance. It's that I have a destiny to fulfill and it's not finished. So no matter how bad the turbulence is, the plane's not going to wreck. The last couple of times I was in a turbulent situation and people were panicking. I just put my seatbelt on and I'm like, relax, I'm on the plane. You're not the pilot. I'm not. 
You don't have control of the plane. I don't. Why are you so confident? Because the God that put me on this earth formed me while I was in my mother's womb. And he didn't call my end like this. This is not how I'm going out. You got to stop looking at the doctor's report as the final report. You got to stop looking at divorce report as the final report. I will believe the report of the Lord. There is another report out there. There is another report out there. And you and I have got to believe that God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent but my God if he said it if he said it I believe it I wish you gave God a praise just take 20 seconds if anybody here feels power to give God You may be seated, you may be seated. God wants you to see with all your heart, with your heart, the hope of your calling, the richness of your gifting, that you are empowered. And here's number four. And I hope you see this. I hope, God, in my strength and in my weakness, you help me communicate this to where your people can see it. Number four. You're needed. You're needed. Acts chapter 19, verse 9. During the night, if I had a few more minutes, I would tell you how amazing it is that God shows up in the darkest of moments. But it was the night time that Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia standing, begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. God showed Paul Macedonia needed him. I know you're busy. I know. I know you got plans. I know. No, I know you got a, a, an agenda that you've laid out and, and your life is difficult. I, I know. But can I say something to you? In the darkest of your nights, hear God saying to you, Yakima needs you. This city needs you and me. You weren't put here to take up space. You were put here to meet a need. You just think about this for a moment. You are the answer to somebody's problem. You are the water to somebody's thirst. You are the bread to somebody's hunger. You are the hope to somebody's hopelessness. You're the hand to wipe away somebody's tear. You're the arm to embrace somebody's brokenness. You, you, you. This city, this church, this community, we need you. We need you at 14. We need you at 25. We need you at 40. We need you at 55. If you're any older, you're going to have to go with Bernie. We need you at 70. We need the prophetic anointing of the older generation. We need you. We need you. We need you. Bernie and I joke a lot, but you better believe that there are times I call him because I need the voice. He was raised in a generation before I was. He saw things my eyes never got to see. There's a deposit in his life I need. Let me conclude by reading to you Acts chapter 26, verse 19. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. Paul tells King Agrippa, I, I got a call in my life. 
And God showed me the richness of my gifting. And he empowered me. And when God called me, I wasn't disobedient. I said, yes. Now, I asked you intentionally how many of you had given your life. You didn't realize it was a setup question. Because 99% of this room is a believer. At one point or another, you gave your life to God. But I need to ask you a question. Have you been disobedient to the call of God in your life? Have you settled for coming to church when he's called you to become the church? Have you settled for whatever it is that makes you comfortable when he's been trying to get you out of your comfort zone? I see so many people come to church, Juan Carlos, over and over and over as if though it's a membership club that they have to stamp their, their, their card at. Don't come here to stamp your card. Come here to get a sense of destiny, purpose. And some of you shaking in your boots because you think I'm coming to your house today to get you to sign up. Well, you're right. I'm following you home today. I'm just asking you a question. I know some of you are like, man, Pastor, it's kind of heavy for a Sunday morning. This is a spiritual growth campaign. Has your level of obedience to the call of God in your life increased or decreased? Do you do more with your walk with God? Or have you felt like I checked in all my boxes getting ready for retirement? We don't retire from Christianity. We grow. I'm trying to end this message, Bernie, but I can't help with thinking that in Numbers chapter 13, two young men named Caleb and Joshua looked at the promised land. They looked at the promised land and they go, dude, yeah, those giants are big. This is tough, but let's take them right now. And everybody else, Pastor Lee, said no. So here were two guys who had the right vision, two guys who were given to spiritual growth, but they had to deal with the lack of faith of everybody else. Forty years they walked in the wilderness and they watched one by one of their family members, of their patriarchs, one by one. They all fell. They all died. And then one day, Omar, Joshua became the leader. And he looked at Caleb and he said, Caleb, do you remember that day? He goes, do I remember it? I've never stopped thinking about it. He said, let's do it. He said, let's do it. They were once young. Now they were old, but they never became disobedient. And when the moment came, as weak as their legs may have been, as weak as their back may have been, their vision was as strong that day as it was the day they first saw the promised land. And here's what I'm telling you today. Are you strong today? Are you feeling courageous today? Are you still obedient to the call of God? Maybe God's calling you to pray for somebody, but because of your experience, you don't want to pray for them. Maybe God's calling you to forgive somebody, but because of your experience, you don't want to forgive them. How can we be Christians and say things like, I forgive, but I won't forget? That reeks of Jesus to me. How do we say things like that, Joe? How do we say that? Hey, all right, you can just don't cross this line right here. Where, do, where does that come from? Can I be honest with you? It comes from a weak Christianity. Christianity based on me and not based on Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm taking on this spiritual growth campaign. I'm not just giving it to you. I'm walking in it myself. Because I'm believing God, Vanessa, for a whole nother level of relationship with God. I really am. In me and in you. So what are we going to do? Here's the first thing. Don't be disobedient one more day. If he says love, love. If he says forgive, forgive. Share this last story. Come on, stand to your feet. It'll make you feel like I'm going to end. <laughs> 